My name is Erica Lauren Ortiz and I use she, her pronouns, Zooming from the land of the Lenape here in Bergen County, New Jersey. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's session. For those of you with access needs, I am a black woman. I have a longish black hair, a medium amount of makeup and a really big smile. And it is my pleasure as a black woman to welcome you to Through a Black Woman's Lens. I do have a bit of housekeeping just before we start. Uh, this session does have captioning and ASL interpretation available, and we have dropped some instructions for how to take advantage of that in the chat. I am here to support any logistics today, so if you have any Zoom trouble, or any questions, you can message me or Anne Charlone uh, privately. We'll also keep an answer, an eye on the chat where the questions will be. Um, just a reminder to keep yourself muted and there will be a chance for us to ask some questions of our panelists at the end. So if you do have those, you can drop them onto our session Padlet or you can drop them here in the chat and we'll make sure to assist you in uh, getting those questions answered. Um, at this time, it is my pleasure to welcome the moderator for this panel. Um, and before I do, I'm going to take just a second of personal privilege to say that before I worked at TCG, I was the um, patron services manager at TKTS. And I used to always tell this story when I worked there, but the first show I ever bought a ticket from uh, at, to TKT, at TKTS was uh, Carolina Change, where I saw the amazing Tanya Pinkins. So it is my pleasure now to welcome her to the screen. Tanya, if you can start your video, um, we will get this show on the road. It tells me I'm unable to start my video. Okay, so we will just make sure that, oh, yeah. there you are. Erica, thank you, Rodney. <laughs> um, I can't tell you how excited I am to be here at TCG, theater is my first love. I want to say that I am coming to you from the unceded territory of the Lene, Lenape, Natikoke, Mahican people in Manhattan. I am a black cisgendered woman with short reddish blondish hair. I'm wearing glasses. I have on um, an African print that is um, blue and gold. I'm sitting in my living room on a white couch. I want to set an intention for our time together that um, every word that is spoken is a blessing to everyone who hears it, that we all are blessed and are a blessing to each other for this time together. Um, the inspiration for this evening, this evening, this time is being a black woman in America. And I thought so many other black people, but black women in particular would understand this. And I wanted to take the opportunity to center black women who have been at the forefront of every movement in America from abolition to suffrage, to education, to civil rights, to Me Too, to BLM, Black women are always supporting everyone. And this is not by way of complaining, this is by way of explaining. Malcolm X said, the most disrespected person in America is the Black woman, the most neglected person in America is a Black woman, and in America is the black woman. He forgot to mention that we are also the one who doesn't allow any of that to keep us from getting the job done. So it's my privilege today to be in conversation with three other amazing black women, academic content creator, artists, director, producers, and we are going to share a little piece of all of our work. Rashad Robinson, who is an inspiration for me, he's the director of Color of Change. He says, never mistake presence for power. And often black women are in the room because we work hard and we work hard to get everything done and to make sure everything is a success. But often when the final result is framed, we are not in the frame for the 
honors and awards. Black women have more degrees than any population in America, but we also have the least amount of wealth of any group in America other than the indigenous people. And so this is an opportunity to uh, center black women, to uh, let people know that we are here, we're doing the work. And if the theater is to have a reckoning in this moment in time, it is time to put the people who have been there all along front and center. We have the skill, we have the talent, we have the ability, we have the vision, and I want to give flowers. This is the first of a series of six panels. So I have to thank TCG, Teresa Ehring, Devin Berkshire, Erica Lauren Ortiz, and Anne Carleon or Sierra Leone. Uh, also, this is being broadcast on HowlRound. So thanks to Vijay Matthew and Thea Rogers. And I have to thank my team, which is the Red Pill team, uh, Katie Rosen, Paul Sue, Doris Kassap, Sam Morris, Allison Banks, and the event producer today, Crystal Chase. I have been working in the theater for 50 years. I have a lot of awards. And yet, I find that I don't get asked what I want to do. I don't get offered support for what I want to do. People are happy to support me in doing what they want me to do. And so today we're gonna to be discussing what do black women want to do? What makes us safe? What makes us uncomfortable? How can everyone support black women in the way that we've been supported, supporting everyone else rather. One of the ways that I've continued to support myself and my guests all support ourselves, we invest in our own work, is that this year I made a film called Red Pill. And I made it as, a, as my opportunity to show the world the way I see America. Many people who've seen the film have asked if I wrote it after the 2020 election. I did not. I wrote it two years before the 2020 election because when you are a black woman and you walk into rooms, I am, I'm gonna speak for myself, I am often invisible despite my accolades or my renown. I am invisible, I am erased, I speak, no one responds, they move on. And so people often speak in front of me in ways that they have no fear that I could ever use the knowledge that they said in any way to harm them. And that is because I know everybody's business. Most black women know everybody's business. And so we can see the patterns of what is going to unfold. And so I wanna share the trailer for my movie, Red Pill. Uh, so that you can have a glimpse of how I've been investing in myself in sharing my vision. We are a majority in this country. And we're going to win the election. Do you know what the red pill is? A red pill is someone who infiltrates a group and then destroys them from the inside. This place is spooky. Take it easy. You know what, guys? I'm gonna go back tomorrow. I think we should call the sheriff's office. What do we do, Amelia? We die. But we take some of them with us. Thank you for indulging me in watching that. Um, horror is my favorite genre. Um, I think horror is the genre where you can talk about the truth. So I took 
my thoughts about being a black woman and seeing how America was going and how this election was going. And I wrote a script and I wrote, produced and directed and acted in a film about it. And when people read that script, they were like, that's so far fetched. <laughs> and then it happened. And then we had the January 6th insurrection. And so um, I think that all of the women here today and all of the women who will join me over the next six months can tell you stories of how they have seen the future, but no one was hearing them. We are often the one who is saying, the emperor has no clothes, but we are invisible and no one is hearing us. So the first um, guest I wanna introduce is Garlia Cornelia. She is a writer, producer, photographer, mother. She's from Detroit and she founded the Blackboard Plays. And right now she's in the midst of production of um, a festival that I had a privilege to participate in. And it is the Black Motherhood and Parenting New Play Festival. We're going to have a clip right now from one of the plays in the festival. This play is called Just Inside. It's by uh, Eureka Lewis and it's directed by Ellen Valencia. Please play that clip. Suspended? Justin? If there's one thing a mother knows, it's her children. Bet is a single mother. What makes you think I'm a single mother? Justin's parents are threatening to sue us. Man, nobody said anything about Black Lives Matter. Where is that coming from? I will not allow the powers that be to pin stuff on my son, the new Black kid. But this kid's mother? There's nobody to play with. I need to hear Justin's side. People believe what they want to believe when they choose to ignore the truth. Thank you. I'm going to introduce everybody before we all start speaking with one another. So my next guest that I'm privileged to introduce is Nicole Hodges Pursley. And I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, as I get all nervous, Nicole is the associate producer of African American theater and performance in the Department of American Studies and African and African American Studies at the University of Kansas. She creates intentional bridges between the entertainment community and academia. She is the artistic director of the KC Melting Pot Theater, which is the premier African American theater company in Kansas. She also co-authored a book with um, our next guest after her. And I'll, I'll tell you that about that then. And we're gonna see a clip from a film that she wrote and produced and directed. Ooh, 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 see how I get so nervous? Um, one second. The film is called Epiphany and it is directed by Nicole Hodges personally, written, sorry, by Louis J. Morrow. Kia and Terrence are a happily married couple who love their daughter dearly. And when she's suspended from school, suspension is something that we Black parents deal with a lot. Um, she learns how closely children listen to their parents and how much it matters that we listen to our children. For mama. Mama. You know it's going to take a little more than some pancakes if you want to get in good with your mama. You're gonna have to say what I told you to say. I know, I've been practicing. Yeah, but you can't say it like you've been practicing or like I told you to say it. You gotta say it like you've really been thinking about it. I have. Good, let me hear it. Mama, I realized that you're right. And no, that- No, 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 yuck. That sounds too stiff. You, you gotta say it like you had an aha moment, an epiphany. What's an epiphany? Oh, so we, we, we don't look up words no more. We just ask what they mean. Sorry. Epiphany. <laughs> How's the pancakes, Mama? I know you like them fluffy. They're pancakes. How's the bacon? Is it crispy enough? It's bacon. <laughs> All that bacon grease on your shirt. 
Hey, Mama. Girl, what the hell are you doing? I had an epiphany. What? I've been thinking, Mama. I'm at the age now where I have to start taking accountabilities for my actions, whether I'm wrong or right. I understand I need to think more and explore all of my options. Oh, you understand that now. <laughs> Girl, you ain't saying nothing except for what your daddy told you to say. Oh, Mama, please. I just want to have a fun day. You'll never off a walk on days I'm out of school. You're not out. <laughs> Thank you. And then my next guest is the co-writer um, of Breaking Down Audition Techniques for Actors with Nicole Hodges Persley. And this is, join me in welcoming Monica White in Dunu. Monica is, she received the distinction honor for the 2016 C. Calvin Smith Book Award from the Southern Conference of African American Studies for her book, Shaping the Future of African American Film. This book is about Hollywood and money, and it is a ready explanation for why so few Black films get made and seem to have no crossover appeal or promise a big payoff. So um, she is also the head of the nonprofit, The Craft Institute, and Monica and Nicole have created a platform for um, BIPOC creators around the world. And I'm gonna let the two of them talk about that. So ladies, let's get started. Um, the first question I'm gonna ask, cause we got the parenting thing going right up front. What has been the biggest challenge for you as parents in advocating for your children in, uh, in school? Oh, where do we begin? Well, I'll start. So <laughs> once my son was uh, in school and the teacher called me up and she said, I'm gonna have to fail him in math because um, we graded the math test in person and, he, and he, his didn't get turned in. And I just wanted to let you know. And I had to say, well, that's not acceptable. If you graded it in class, who graded it? And where is it at? But you cannot fail my child. And so a month or so went by, I'm sure that was not the answer she was expecting to get. And a month later, she found the test in a pile and it was the highest grade in the class. <clears throat> uh, I had similar events. Um, I started really early telling my child to take her phone to school and to document all of the work that she turns in and to film the clock, film her hand and a witness uh, because so much work was lost. And um, she is, a, you know, a, a lingua. Our family loves to study languages. I can't tell you how many French homeworks were lost, how many math homeworks, and then uh, her being positioned as a child who sometimes loses her work. Uh, but as soon as we started the photo evidence, suddenly all of that just ha just went away. It was really interesting. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think we have to equip our kids to be able to advocate for themselves, but also to provide now, sadly, evidence of what they're doing, because a lot of it, I think, is interestingly strategic, sadly. But yeah, I'm not surprised at that story. Any other stories, ladies? Garlia, you haven't gone to school yet, so we're, <laughs> we're getting you ready for that. How about you, Monica? Um. I have many stories, but I'll just recount um, a, a more general issue that I've encountered. So I have three children um, in various age ranges, as Nicole knows. <laughs> um, I'll be parenting forever. But um, my, um, so all of my kids have had similar experiences as being, you know, some of the only black children in predominantly white um, school district. And what we have found is um, very often there's, there's always some sort of concern raised about whether or not the student can actually or the child can actually do the work. When uh, my kids have tended to be advanced in their work, you can hear one of them in the background now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 
But yeah, and so having to um, not only advocate for my child, but advocate for all of the black children um, within the school and the school district. So now it's gotten to the point where me and um, a couple of other black parents, we're actually working with the school district in order to help transform the curriculum and a lot of the activities that are happening throughout the school district so that our, our kids will actually be able to have a better learning experience. Um, but it's, it's really challenging because you may know I'm in the Boston area. And so you all know the history of, you know, busing and all of that stuff in the Boston area. And so I just find that as a black parent, whenever I'm advocating for my own children, it's always, it always ends up having to be advocacy for everybody's children. That's what we do. And that, that reminds me of a quote that I, I found from Stacey Abrams. She says, you know, like most who are underestimated, um, I have learned to overperform and find soft but key ways to take credit. So how, you know, from my own experience, I know that I'm always passed over for the job. And then in fact, I said to a producer once, I said, so you won't give me this, you know, entry level job. Oh, no. I said, but you will give it to, you know, this person over here and I have a lifetime more experience than them. And in a few years, they're going to be my boss. And they're like, yeah, that's just the way it goes. So let's talk about the ways in which we have the experience, we have the talent, we have the vision, and somehow it's always somebody else's chance. We are just not in position for that next move. I mean, I, I think something I've done that I have no, no that, that, that I've started to really note about myself and something I started when I was in a college is I just I just created my my own spaces. And, and then as I grew older, I, I realized that so many of the, of the black women in particular that I was like, yeah, we're, we really have a vibe. They also had to create their own spaces because the institutions um, don't always create spaces for, for us, right? You know, when I was eight, eight to 10, I went to Indiana University and I noticed that in our theater department, there wasn't spaces for any black students. And so I started a black the theater group and I produced and but directed a raisin in the sun and it and um and it was great. I mean it, it was there were so many people that 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 came out to sub support because people were ex excited because it was something that they they need they needed right and so my entire career has just been saying that's what I want to do I want to create spaces for black artists because we need our stories told whether it's through po po poetry whether we you know write our you know take take pieces of of we'll play play plays and makes something new. I have a shelf full of awards that I got at at school because I have that group. I w worked on an MA as 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 well 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 to 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 at IU. So I just had a ton of time to just sit with creating spaces for black stories and that's what I did with black board and that attracted me to the people I met and we formed Harlem of not nine and then that's also what's created this festival for black parents so it's always oh my my daughter oh daughter was like show your she's just handing me an award um <laughs> thank you thank you if I don't get flowers, I'll get them from her, right? Um, but but it's it's just creating our 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 own, and I've gotten so used to just do doing that that whenever I feel that there isn't a space for me, 
the way I get angry is I'm like, that's fine. I'm gonna go do, do, do this over, over here. Right. So like, if I don't feel like every, it's like, oh, great. So I just created this, this, this whole festival. I have Tanya Pinkins in the, in, in, in the festival. I mean, you know, and we're supporting black moms and it's going to be awesome. And so that's what, that's what, what we, we do. And that's how I get through, through, through it, you know. That is what we all do. All of us. We we you all, tell us about the platform you've created for for Black artists, Nicole and Monica. Um, I was, you know, it, this is a obviously a, like kind of like a comfort food circle to be in a circle of other Black women of hearing like the modus is the same that you know we're rejected over and over and over again to the point where we don't even petition to get into the situation anymore. We just create our own space because. Ultimately, you know, uh, it's very painful to go through those processes over and over petitioning, like, haven't I done enough yet to be recognized? Um, I've been told, you know, lots of different things, but Create Ensemble, Monica and I, you know, we're both reluctant collaborators. In fact, I just, you know, sent her a draft of our origin story, like minutes before this panel um, for this new platform, but it's called Create Ensemble and ensemble in French is ensemble, which means together. And, and it's just that simple. Why can't we as artists of the global majority create together because there's room for all of us. Mm -hmm. And so we loved working together after kind of being burned at different points of our life. And then we said, you know, I came to her, I said, you know, I have this idea. Why can't we just bring black and brown creatives together and kind of bypass the middleman of the agents and the managers who tell you like, you can't do this, or you have to wait to do this. We're like, we don't have to do any of that. It's kind of like, we're like the Spotify for creatives, you know, of you can own your own masters. Like you are your own master of your artistry. And so, um, and so I went to Monica and she loved the idea. She had ideas of how she could add to it. And um, her partner is, a, is an engineer and we became a trio and uh, they started helping shape the idea and they, they, they switched and changed the idea and it became something that we all created together, which is Create Ensemble. And it's a collaborative platform for creatives of the global majority. Um, there's no cost. We say, you know, come to us to find the missing parts, which are other creatives like-minded who want to help you fulfill your part and then you help somebody else fulfill their part and we work together and so um i think that's kind of, is that a good version of the story monica what do you say i think that that's a great version of the story and i think the other part that i would add too um for for all those creatives out there nicole and i we're also actors and directors and in in doing this work we have ideas of projects that we want to do and sometimes so I may be hired to direct the show or something, or I have something that I'm working on. And she had a similar, um, a similar um, situation where you get, you have all this creative energy flowing, you like ready to go. And then you have to stop and find, well, who can I get, you know, to be my cinematographer on this project? And, and people, you don't have to explain things to about the importance of lighting black skin, you know, for example. Um, so being able to recruit people to work on your project who are already, um, you know, culturally, culturally literate and also skilled in, in um, the various areas of technique that may be needed. And even people who are looking for opportunities to grow, that we can actually start to build our own villages at all stages of development, giving one another. Again, on the platform, you can sign up as an individual talent or and or as an organization. I have a profile as an individual talent as well as for the Craft Institute. Um, you can join the circles and you know correspond in the same ways that people tend to do in Facebook groups, um, and and those can also be protected spaces. And you can connect with people on the platform, you know, direct messaging and and all of that. Anything you can do on any other social media platform. I won't say anything, but a lot of things that you can do on other social media platforms, you can also do on Create Ensemble. And while we're still in the beta phase, the um, platform is available and open, you know, so we encourage people sign up today and even reach out to Nicole and I, because we also host 
um, open houses where we will walk you through how to set up your profile, how to use the platform and that sort of thing. But we really just wanna grow a network so that we can all support each other in, in our efforts. And so, yeah, it was something that we didn't feel um, mm -hmm. existed to support us. So we made it like Garley. So. And I wanna jump on that because um, in your book, um, Monica, you talk about how, you know, Hollywood says that it's about um, capitalism and that's supposedly what Broadway is about is capitalism. But you, you, you chart the statistics of the return on investment for films made by people of color versus films made by non-melanated people. And the return on investment is huge. And what I got to thinking when I looked at it, it was like, oh, it's not that we want more money back. It's that these are the people we want to give the money to. We're going to keep giving the money to our people. And we don't even care if we make our money back because we can write it off as a tax deduction. We are not being invested in because people don't want to invest in us. There is plenty of money to be made off of us. We are the global majority. There is a larger audience of people of color on the planet for everything, but there is a, an agenda, a mission to sell a specific thing. So the question is, and please, if you all have something you wanna say, please don't make it feel like I gotta do the questioning. The decolonization of your mind. How did you get to the place where you can decolonize your mind to know that you didn't have to go through the gatekeeper, that you could create what you wanted to create and that there's an audience for it? Mm -hmm. I think for me, it was the process of writing that first book where um, what inspired the book is a lifetime of watching movies and, um, and plays and reading books and that sort of thing. And so while the title, it, it focuses mostly on African-American film, I also talk about the theater industry and publishing industry as well, because there's similar patterns um, across, across those industries. And so I think in the process of writing it, originally I thought when I first started writing the book, I was under the impression that there were not a lot of black films being made. Like, how can we get more black films to be made? Like that was my original goal. And then I started doing the research and I realized there's a plethora of black films that are being made all the time. You know, looking at Nicole's project, you know, you have people who are on the grind making these movies. And so I'm like, well, why can't I see them? And so I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida. And um, where I grew up, it wasn't like, you know, in New York, sometimes you have like places where you can go and you can see indie films and that sort of thing. Those films didn't travel to where I grew up. And so I was like, well, where are they going? And, and how do I get access to those things? And so in the process of writing a book and, and discovering how many films, like there are hundreds of films by black creatives that are made every year that we will never see. And so then the question became, well, if we have these movies, why can't we see them? And that's when I started to learn more about distribution and connections to um, how distribution deals and, and the investment patterns. And then um, initially I was like, oh, so it's just that black films don't make a lot of money. Wrong again. So every time I'm thinking, well, I have the answer. I figured it out. And then you do more research. And so for this book, I actually tracked data for nearly uh, 2,000 films by and about people of African descent or including um, people of African descent made from 1980 to like the early the 2010s. And I tracked the economic data, narrative patterns, investment patterns, distribution patterns, and uh, marketing patterns, like all of these things only to find out that there are so many um, multiple black films made that don't get distributed. Black films um, are invested in at a lower rate. And so where the standard investment um, for like a, a predominantly white cast film is 20 million upwards. For black films, it's five to 15. If you could get to the five, like that's on the, that's when you're in the wow. stage, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and that's the, the ones that we're thinking about that are big budget for, for a black film, right? And so um, and seeing, so I'm thinking, well, maybe they just don't make a lot of money. But when you start to look at not just the gross amounts that a film makes, but you look at the return on investment. So how much was invested 
and compare it to how much they made, Black films have like a 300% return on investment compared to predominantly white films almost every time. And so, and Hollywood knows this. And so I thought, well, they keep saying it's all about money, but I'm like, that can't be right. Because if that were true, then we would be investing more in where we know we're making more money. And so um, you can actually track by the narrative patterns of even which, which predominantly black cast films receive the highest budgets and the greatest distribution, there's a preference for certain narratives um, and certain characters and that sort of thing. And so if you ever need something to help you make the case, I encourage you, you can use the information in that book. It took a very long time to write it, but it was worth it. And that's how I decolonized my mind, so to speak, by learning more about all of the giants of whose shoulders that we stand, who you know are in the trenches, on the grind, doing the work. Some of them, their names will never know, but they persisted anyway. And knowing what their struggle has been it made me feel like it's not only my my responsibility, but an honor to keep pushing and to a way for everybody that's coming along with me and coming coming beyond me. So, um, for me, I think it was more. I, I wasn't as beautiful of a story. Mine was really coming with the naivete that talent merited reward uh, coming through Hollywood. You know, I went to an HBCU, I went to Spelman College. Um, I worked, um, you know, in theater there and really uh, had a, every belief that, you know, my talent would carry me. And I was fortunate. I was one of those kids who went to LA, I auditioned, I made it on episodic TV. I was able to do uh, you know, things, but the work was so sporadic and I knew I was, you know, right. And I had a lot to offer and I didn't feel that I needed permission to wait for this agent to tell me, oh, my hair was too curly or I was too skinny or I was too fat or I was like, but what about my mind? And what about my talent? Because I knew I was good at what I was doing. I had trained, I had come ready. And I just, after being turned down, I think I went out on every single improv show from, you know, Mad TV and everything besides SNL. And people would say things like, you know, you just kind of need your own thing. You know, you're just, you're so different. <laughs> and I was like, that was code. This is like mid nineties, right? So the racially ambiguous body, you know, always trending in Hollywood, you know, from the beginning to the present, but thinking about like, what does that really mean when our bodies are compartmentalized and it is, we're completely disassociated from our talent. And for me, I just was like, look, I'm bigger than this. Uh, my vision, I knew Hollywood history. I knew where my body fit within that narrative of the Freddie Washingtons of the world, et cetera. And I was like, you know, I'm gonna shift to directing because I knew that if I could, you know, be, in control of what narratives I could empower other actors, you know, I would be fine with that. But that was the thing for me. I just got tired of waiting for permission. I was exhausted. I was depressed. And I was like, I, why am I depressed? I've put in my investment. I, I deserve to be able to do this. So like, you know, um, Garlia, you know, I just, I said, I'm going to make my own stuff. And I think it was probably, I finished UCLA in 1997. I took a break, worked and started my own theater company in LA. And, um, and then I went back to get the doctorate primarily to have an arsenal, an intellectual arsenal that I could not be stopped. <laughs> that I could continue to know my history and know theater history. And, um, and I've been going ever since. I never, I never looked back. So th this is something popped into my head that's been on my heart for a while. I'm a, I think I'm an old one generation before you ladies. And there's a lot of talk now about trauma porn and we don't wanna see trauma porn. And as Monica has said, there are every kind of story that you wanna see about black people is being made. 
Um, Red Pill has been in festivals all over the world, won awards all over the world. I have seen some of the most extraordinary films to rival anything coming out of Hollywood. And yet not a single one of these amazing films is even available to be seen in America. Not only are they not distributing it, there's actually a block on our stories and films getting told unless they serve a certain narrative. There's a specific image that they're selling about us and they don't want us to even be seen by the world in any way other than this very narrow view. So I, I wanna talk about trauma porn because um, I feel like, you know, the generation that grew up with these in their hands, what their trauma is, is very different than what trauma is for me. So my generation, I got beat with extension cords and belts, but the mind doesn't know the difference between a thought, a reality, and now between something that's in a screen. And I think that people now are living so much in screens with so much violence that there is a fragility of mind that makes them not want to see stories that I long to see because when I was growing up, there were no stories about Black people. When I felt oppressed, I had to identify with Anne Frank and the Jews exodus from Israel because I wasn't learning any stories about my own people's struggle. So for me now, when I see these stories, I'm like, oh, there were some of us, we struggled, we failed, we succeeded. I'm grateful for it. But there seems to be a moment where people don't want to know about that. What is your response to that? I, I don't know. Uh, go ahead, Monica. Yeah, I was going to say, I have, I have lots of feelings about that. I think it's, it's complicated. Um, and so What's complicated about it is, I'll just go into um, how people don't want an, any more stories about slavery. You know, like that's been a big conversation right now. And so, and we talk about this in um, some of the classes I teach. And so what I think is not so much that, because I, I feel like we need as many stories as we can, because stories are the way we process who we are, um, where we've been, where we are, where we're going. It, it's, it's, I mean, and, and especially in our cultures, African-based cultures, um, it's vital to, you know, our communities. And so I think historically, like there was a sense of shame around slavery that I think still lingers for some people. So it's like, I don't wanna see our people like that and that sort of thing. But I also believe it's very important that we're telling um, the stories of every facet of our existence, every of our existence, every stage, every angle. However, here's the problem: the ways in which those stories have been told have traumatized our people. So there's a need to tell that story, but who controls the narrative is the problem. And so um, historically, and so that one of the things I do um, talk about in, in the book is, you know, pr pr projects about slavery and also even the use of horror. Cause I think horror is the perfect genre to explore slavery. Like is, if there ever was a genre <laughs> to explore it. Uh, Cause I think, I mean, um, and Toni Morrison does it so brilliantly in Beloved but I think even when that film was translated um, across, or that story was translated across mediums, I think they missed the point. The horror was not beloved. It was the institution of slavery and what it did to the people in the community. And the director. Okay, so I was not <laughs> going to say it, Nicole. This is why, this is what our conversation be like. Cause I was, I was trying to keep it on the level. Oh, no, he ruined <laughs> You ruined the color purple. No, no, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so so the thing is, it's who's controlling the narrative. We need more control over our stories to be able to tell every aspect of what's happened to us and what we want to happen. And that's the part that's not happening. Um, and I think that's what's traumatizing people, but I don't think 
I don't think we need to run away from our history and I don't think we need to run away from our pain. Um, I don't think that our pain is all that is to us. I think there's so much more, but I do think we need the spaces where we can deal with our pain without an audience um, and without bystanders, you know, um, people who will sit there and, and witness us, you know, grieving and processing. So um, one example I, I directed Passover um, by Antoinette Nwandu here in the Boston area um, last season, right before the pandemic. And one of the things that I implemented because um, that play for anybody who's familiar with it, it, it is very traumatic um, because it's something that we continue to live with as a community. And one of the concerns I had about it, even when I was hired to direct it, and I asked, um, you know, one of the questions is like, who is this play for? And how do we do it in a way that ensures that it does not harm the community it represents? Because I think she's told a very powerful story or, you know, tapped into something that's really happened in our communities. And so how do you honor the work that she's done and also ensure that the community uh, that's being represented is taken care of. So one of the things we did was after each performance, we closed the space off and uh, invited black and brown people to stay within the space. And we had a healer that took them through a process of how to deal with everything that showed up in their bodies as they bore witness to what we put on the stage. And what was interesting about that is that um, a lot of uh, white patrons complained about, you know, not being able to, to stay in the space of wanting to know what we were doing in there and that sort of thing. And so it was even in that process where I realized that, you know, I think we need more of this. I think we need more of those spaces where we can, you know, tell our stories the way they resonate for us, but also be able to grieve together and privately. That's the kind of the thing though, with, I mean, but from the theatrical, we have an unreconciled relationship as a nation to the, the enslaved experience of uh, people of the African diaspora forced migrants to the country. And uh, to skip over the recognition of our trauma and our pain and not recognize it, but yet then to commodify it and, and, and show it as entertainment is problematic for me, whether that be on any stage uh, that I think that there has to be a pretext and context. And so who has the right to tell the story? Uh, you know, that's up for grabs. If you're in the story, you have the right to tell it. But the idea that we uh, have to be these um, kind of reluctant participates in our participants in our own trauma you know when you have a writer who's their first gig is getting a greenlit deal to do a show that is about enslavement what is, how do you go from i have no money i've been waiting for this moment my whole life and the deal that i'm getting is to get a greenlit show whether it be on netflix or your first broadway show is this whatever it is or your first off-broadway show for that matter I think that there's such a lack, a dearth of capital investment in black artists that when we have the break, we have a different grappling than, you know, Lena Dunham did. Lena Dunham just, just kind of like, I have an idea. You know, it's like me and my friends and we're in New York. Great, here's the deal. We have to pitch that 22 times and get rejected before we get that. Same with a show. I, you can have a show about nothing and it gets picked up at off-Broadway theater. It could be like, it's like me walking my dog. It's so funny. It's so hilarious. It's a show. We have to, we always have to be suffering or grappling with the, the condition. I mean, you know, so I think that it's not a shame, you know, to talk about slavery. I, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that we've got to get to the structures of inequity and it's about money. It's about the legibility. They don't want to hire us. They want to hire someone who knows us, but doesn't look like us. They want someone who's been legitimized through the systems that have been approved. Right? So if you don't, if your degree isn't from this area, if you haven't been at this theater, if you're not vetted by this, you know, so we have so many hoops to go through that it's exhausting. 
So by the time you get a break, you've been emerging for 20 years. <laughs> right. I saw Ava DuVernay made her first film at 35. I'm like, well, I made my first film at 57. Um, but so I, what I call that is the leashes that you got to be on a leash that the access to the resources is if you're on our leash so that we going to own a piece of it, we still share cropping. You know, I, I say they, they, the gatekeepers will treat their pets very, very well. They give them golden cages and leashes and collars. And if you are willing to get on their leash, you might get the sun and the moon. So you all have managed to still create. I managed to create without a leash that nobody is controlling how I tell my stories. I, I, I feel like that is a challenge to us as artists. Um, uh, someone said to me that if that it isn't a resource issue, because if, if all of our resources, just black people in America's resources were pulled together, we'd be the 16th largest economy in the world. But the resources being invested back in us, which we know from Tulsa and the Red Summer that when we invest in ourselves, they bomb us. So I think we have to assume that's an inevitable, that whatever we build, they're gonna destroy. So we have to plan to rebuild until we can have a place and space of our own. But I think that saying, well, I now I got the money and I gotta do what they say because I've been waiting for the money. I, I, don't, I don't think that's a good excuse. No, I, I, this this whole conversation around emerging and you know try, try, try we're working to be in sort of both spaces. I feel like we end up just being so exhausted because we, we, we need to pay the bills. And so maybe we get the big call, right? And the big call keeps us doing m m many things, but that big call may not necess necessarily be supporting port port our people or the sto stories that we want to, to 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 tell so 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 we keep doing all the other things and I think if I'm speaking specifically about me I you know I have one part of my life over here right and then I have multiple organizations I'm a, a, a part of that support black artists and many of my friends and people in these groups we're all doing this 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 same thing. We have our hands in the institutions. We have to pay our bills. We, you know, have to take care of our children. And I, you know, think when you're thinking about being a being a a, a parent and being a a, a caregiver. A go giver and being a black mom, a mom, a mom, mom, you that sense of you that sense of you emer emerging is like endless, you know this 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 year year i changed my life a hundred per per percent so the way that my life looked uh, uh, last year i just fl flipped it on its head right and and then this year i was not only working at the public but also t teaching i had an artist installation at the at the public, and then I had my my pl play being produced where I was t t teaching, and then all of these other pro pro projects, and they all mean a, a lot to 
to to to to to to me and also because i'm you know i had kids when i was in my like late 20 so i i took a big pause right and so i feel like you know there is this piece of me that's like i'm trying i'm trying to kind of you know, catch up even though even though i know i probably don't have to and people will say you're doing fine i think for for me you see you know there's always that sense like these things make us oh this person is do doing this and i gotta do this and all and all of that but i i just that sense of being a black woman who, who creative who has to do all of the things and be all of the things for all of the all of the pe people is 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 a thing I know I have seen my whole, whole life I know we all oh, oh, know that in this space I mean I know I'm just pre preaching to the choir because this this is what 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 we do and and so often it, it comes from a place of like we believe we believe leave in this 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 work and all of it has to be done because we want people to have opportunity to 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 opportunities you know um and i and i think and just to you know i i i have this speech impediment which i've had since i was uh, just and it is the first barrier that I think a lot, most people would say, you know, you couldn't say black woman and then have a specific speech impediment. Oh, it's over. I mean, I might as well just sit on the, I might as well just sit in the corner and not do anything, but I, I end up, uh, I just made it. I made a decision, and at some point, I was a, te a, te a teenager that this wasn't gonna stop me. And um, so it's not really the first thing I think of. It's it's the last thing. I'm like, oh right, I have that thing. <laughs> but yeah, I I just you know I. I, I feel like we're 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 all really working to break for, break for, break for free. I have this goal of being able to do one big thing and not five, you know, not all the things. That's what I I want for all of us, and I want for myself. But I want I want to do one big thing. So how 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 can we stop doing all this? And it's resource. So. So sources. We need the the resources, and they're not coming to us and and enough. And we always have to fight for them and say, no, I can I can really do it. I can be an artistic director, director. I can be your lead. This I can be be that be that. But we have to prove and like break our our necks proving it so off of my soapbox but i mean this is not at, all. not at all i have two more things i want to um ask of you before we open it up part of it is something i want to say so really all of us are polymaths we can do a whole lot of things and i, I i'm going to speak for myself it is rare that i walk into a room where anyone is as creative as talented as smart as experienced, as educated, as well-traveled as I am, much less to walk into rooms where people have more. I wanna be in rooms where I'm learning, where I'm growing. Um, is it your experience that you're, you know, always the, the biggest dick in the room? <laughs> I aspire to be you when I grow up, so I'm just putting that out there. <laughs> that out there we're all aspiring to tanya landia but you're um, all polymaths you all do a whole lot of things and I, I i was um at ebony booth's play at playwrights i know it wasn't playwrights it was the atlantic theater too 
And it was a wonderful play about a black woman working in like an Amazon warehouse. And she kept having to apologize for her accomplishments. Here she is in like the lowest of the low jobs, but she has to apologize for the fact that she went to college because all of the non-melanated people around her were like, you went to college? You really from here? I mean, it was just this horrible thing. And at the end, at the talk back, um, you know, because, and, and my movie is definitely about white women's participation in white supremacy, because I think we don't the whole space of diversity and inclusion. If you give it to them, then diversity and inclusion is taken care of. So I really wanted to make a movie and talk about that. But I said that because of that mythology of the white woman as prize, when women like us who are smart, who are talented, who can do it all, walk into the room, it's, it, it doesn't exist. It's a unicorn. It doesn't exist. And so they don't see us. They have to erase us because we're an impossibility. Attractive, successful, intelligent. And a white woman and her girlfriend got up, walked all the way across the, the theater down to come to the stage to look me in my face and say, I'm not going to sit here and listen to that kind of talk. Thus proving the point. Isn't this your experience, ladies? This is being recorded, so... Um... <laughs> it's being recorded! <laughs> I mean, I don't think that... I mean, I, I know, I mean, I, I have no problem telling people, like, I know I'm good at what I do. And, you know, and so I have no problem saying that. And I have no problem uh, owning my areas of expertise. I, when you bring me in, I know what I'm doing, I'm prepared, and I'm good at it. Uh, and I uh, think that it's okay. Um, it's okay for, you know, a white male to say that he's a really good director, and he knows what he's doing. But somehow we have to kind of be like meek and mild about our gifts and talents. And it's not arrogance, it's a surety. We've invested in ourselves. We are very well read, we're well degreed, we're well experienced. And we do over abundantly beyond, you know, we walk in, you know, I've seen directors walk in, we'll oh, just figure it out. We'll just feel it out. We don't, do we have time to feel it out? I mean, I thought we were, is, I mean, I came in prepared. I know where the actors are going. I know what the next step is. I have everything planned, but John can come in unplanned and just be like, I'm just not feeling it. You know, I think I'm just going to take a break. Let's just breathe. We don't have time. I thought we were on a clock. And so I think when my excellence is not even, you know, appreciated, even when I do come full prepared and uh, ready, um, that's the heartbreaking part of it. And so instead of, you know, being bitter, I really started using my allies and accomplices differently. And I have white women that I am really good friends with that I can be unapologetically black with. And I say, you have privilege. I need you to go in and do this for me. Can you walk into that room and say X, Y, and Z because it's going to sound differently coming from you. And I feel really confident that I have a, a you know, at least three relationships that I know I can count on that I have white women who will advocate for me in spaces that I need that for. Is that my normal experience? Absolutely not. I mean, absolutely not as far as taking up the space, you know, or gaslighting all of the labor that you bring to a meeting or to a room and it's completely ignored. But then when you're talk after you're quiet, another person says the same thing and it's just brilliant. Like that's mind blowing to me that that's still happening in 2021. Okay, so I'm gonna open it up, but I wanna ask you, everybody said, we're agreed when Garlia said that there's a one big thing you wanna do. So um, we have some people here in the room and all of those people have um, you know, connections to other people. It's like a big wave out here. So I want you to, to put out an ask in support of the one big thing. I want you to put an ask out here. And I just am knowing that everybody who's in this room is going to uh, stand in agreement and making that happen and going to use their resources to connect out the waves to um, help the asks that these brilliant women have put are about to put out, make them happen. Garlia, let's start with you. 
Um, well, you know, the, the big thing I've, I've been saying is I do produce a lot, but I really want to focus on my writing. And so, you know, I'm, I'm supporting the creation of a grant. So a black parent playwright that isn't, 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 isn't me can receive this funding to focus on their writing and support their, their family. So I really, I want this grant to be huge, but I need I need a pause <laughs> and I need that in in my life too. And I have a lot of plays that needs to be worked on and my brain is explode, doesn't have the space. <laughs> so okay. yeah. You, are, you need this big grant to fund you right, being a writer now. You've been supporting other people as a producer. You are ready for the support for you as a writer. I, I, I'm standing in agreement, it's happening, it's happening. Nicole. Well. I mean, my, my ask is, you know, I love, I love to collaborate with other black producers. I mean, I'd love to collaborate with Aaliyah Jones Harvey. You know, I, I love the work that she's doing and Steven Berg. Um, I mean, I think as two of the principal black producers on Broadway and that have done that work, um, I love that they're making space and I hope that they will reach out and work with emergent directors and artists and not only with, you know, the, the top two, you know, who I love, like, I love Kenny, I love Lazo, I love Camilla, I like, they're my, you know, heart, but I'm just hoping that, you know, I would love to see, you know, a producer make an incubator for Black, you know, women directors, and not making us do things like AD, as if we still need to apprentice. Um, we don't need to AD, we're good. We've directed 30 shows, we're, we're good. That's not a, that's not like a leg up. You're not helping us by demoting us to AD, which is a different job, by the way. It's not the same job, just in case anyone didn't know that, not the same job, but that would be my ask. I'd love to work, my dream thing was be like, I'd love to work with Stephen Bird and Leah Jones Harvey. Um, I'd love to work with folks that are translating between the, the theater and streaming world, because I think there's a lot of beautiful properties in the archive of uh, black theater that I think we have the knowledge as this collective to translate and develop for major streaming networks, um, you know, things like that. Monica. My big ask is reparations. Um. <laughs> Mic drop, you just, you just. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I would love to see a collective concerted effort to actually repair the damage of white supremacy, institutionalized racism and anti-blackness. And there are very specific ways um, that we're working to do some of that labor through the Craft Institute and in collaboration with a lot of different individuals and entities. And so I would love for people to join us in that. And part of that, I think, is supporting efforts like Create Ensemble that can help bring us together so that we can bypass those barriers that have made it difficult, if not impossible, for us to, to actually finally emerge. And I get to go last, and I'm gonna I'm gonna support Monica. I I I'm I don't we don't need jobs, we don't need doors opened, we just need the resources. Give us our reparations. We have the resources, we will build kingdoms as we have done. We 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 have a history that is so much longer than the history of these ununited states. So just I'm looking for the resources to continue to build the the kingdoms that I have in mind. Is there anyone um, out there who has a question for anyone on the panel and they want to come up right now in these last 10 minutes? Well, while we're waiting, um, everybody should join Create Ensemble. It is um, in the chat and the Craft Institute, support the Craft Institute. Um, also, if you're in Kansas City area, um, Nicole Hodges Persley. Is there a link, Garlia, for your play festival that's in the chat right now that everybody can do that? And then I'm going to put the link for uh, the website for my movie so you can find out where you can see it. And we're so grateful that um, you came in and talked with us. Any questions coming from anybody, Erica? Anybody there have any questions? But I will lift up some of the comments from the Padlet. Um, someone says, 
It's a falsehood that Black-centered shows or shows with non-traditional casts don't make money or have broad-based appeal. Think of Black Panther and Hamilton. The Suzy Awards has a goal of creating safe space for everyone. And there is a link also to Suzy Awards. Okay, that's from Tony, uh, who's in the room. Hey, Tony. Um, also, uh, there's an anonymous comment that says, I have a good friend who is a wonderful actress. She's biracial. She was told, you're not black enough to play this part or white enough to play that part. She has done a lot of Shakespeare because they don't care about color when casting. We are looking for ways to change that, ways to encourage non-traditional casting and ways to encourage more stories that feature women of all shades. So craft, you're gonna creative ensemble, you're gonna join there because you're gonna find that community of people. Um, I'm sure that we ladies here are going to all collaborate together because we should. Um, I say that if all of us just supported and uplifted everything that each one of us, and I'm saying not just us on the panel, but everyone who's here listening, if we all made a concerted effort to support any other artist of color, even if that's retweeting, we Instagramming, if we just kept uplifting one another, we would have so much more power because we need to know each other, find out about each other, use the networking and connections that is part of our lineages as people from the diaspora. That That's how we do. So we've got to reconnect with the naturalness of who we are as a people, with our culture, and let go of this capitalist, colonialist death economy that's about extracting from one place and hoarding in, in another place. We are about flow. We keep the things flowing between one another. I'm, I'm happy to collaborate with you. I'm grateful to you all for coming and being in conversation with me. Thank you to TCG. Thank you to HowlRound. I want to give each of you ladies um, th the last word. Um, I just, I, I really appreciate being in this this space. I haven't seen Nicole or Monica. I saw them both in person and met them both like two years ago. So that was such a beautiful um, space to do to do, do, do that. And I wanna let everyone know that the Black Motherhood and Parenting New Play Festival launches in 45 min minutes. So I'm hopping off here and then pushing this thing. My editor, J J J John, he and I are doing both of the streams. So we're gonna push the stream through, but please support. I put the, the subscribe in there and how to get tickets. We have four weeks, four new plays by Black Mother playwrights. Um, we have four partner th theaters, OSF, St. Louis Rap, Detroit Public Theater, and Bishop Arts. I see Teresa Coleman Walsh in the chat. So all the sh shout outs and mic drop. <laughs> I just want to thank everyone who came to this and thank Tanya for having the courage to have an honest conversation about this. And if, if, if people are looking to think about what they can do to support Black female artists, find someone in your community, find someone on your social media, you know, random acts of kindness or, you know, social media support, uh, financial support, amplifying their names when you're in a room and you have access, say their names, uh, you know, that you know us and you see us. This is really important and really valuable advocacy. And so, um, again, thanks to TCG and HowlRound and to the inimitable Tanya Pinkins. Yeah, I think my fellow panelists have said it all. So all I will say is I have um, so much gratitude for being here. Very grateful to everyone and looking forward for, to us, you know, continuing to do the work together. So thank you all so much. Be blessed and, you know, take really good care of yourselves. Guess what? We have a little more time and I can't let this moment go. I can't waste a minute of it. So as a horror movie lover, ladies, black women, what scares you? Like in horror films or like- no, what, scares you? what scares you? Not in horror films. What? So racism. racism. Yeah, I would say, I agree. The threat to my child, I think the ways that systemic racism is a is a environmental threat to my child on a daily basis. So I think that's Yeah, it's 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 the same. It's it's not 
being able to protect my children from this like this out, out outside force in the world that they don't fully understand. Do you have ideas about what has to happen that would make you safe, make them safe? What does it look like? I, I, for me, I think the start of it is the reckoning um, that we've seen in these converging pandemics. Um, but but more so, I think I'm I'm more concerned with the awakening of black and brown people to our own power. Um, like what that looks like and how that manifests. For me, I think that's what it is. I think we, uh, I, I think this is Audre Lorde, but we are the ones we've been waiting for. Mm. I, I think it's us. And, and I think um, we, that's the thing we have to teach our children. Cause if we're talking about fear, I think in addition to like big racism, you know, there's the racism that seeps inside of the soul. Um, Toni Morrison talks about that in, um, in Beloved, how, you know, it can make you feel so dirty. You know, those encounters can, can dirty you in a way that you can't, you, you will never feel clean again. And I think um, for us to create processes and spaces and to work within um, and within our own collective healing and and power, I think that's what's needed in in every aspect of what we do, not just our work, but in our lives. And I've been putting some. Um some resources in the chat of things that are filling me up right now uh in class with car on saturdays at youtube with karen hunter is my my church uh, narrative.com is the largest africana studies program in the world uh you are your best thing which which is a collection of essays by tarana burke and Brene brown is so inspiring um we are each other's harvest which is a book by the, the woman who uh, wrote the book that Cream Sugar, the series is based off of an incredible book on black farmers. Ladies, are there other things that you are reading or listening to that are lifting you up that you could shout out and put in the chat? Uh, everything James Baldwin, everything Audre Lorde. I mean, I think Audre Lorde is a, you know, revisiting Audre Lorde is a great primer for this moment. Um, I think a lot of her insights were uh, you know, prescient of the things that she said would we would, would be required of us to speak truth to power, and um, you know, we we need one another. So I would say that. Um, what am I reading right now? Right now, I'm rereading Zora Neale Hurston because I'm about to direct her. So I'm reading like short stories, and I'm about to direct, you know, uh, poker, and you know, uh, playing with some fun stuff. So. Um, Hurston is another person to revisit because she's so unapologetic on the page that, you know, she could give two squats about what's going on out, get out there, focus on what's right here. So I focus on you all. I am so fed by listening to your stories that I'm about to go drill down into everything that everybody's doing and um, practice what I preach, make sure I'm amplifying the women around me. Yeah, I, th I think I would add in terms of reading, um, you, you hear me quoting Toni Morrison a lot, um, primarily because I think she has been one of the most, I don't even wanna say it's courageous, but just real um, mm -hmm. artists that I've followed. She's um, from the very beginning, she's been very clear about her stance and created her art in a way that um, aligned with her values and her vision. And I think um, she's a really good go-to person for me if ever I feel like I need to um, a refresher on like what that looks like and what it feels like to be an audience for, for that type of work. Um, additionally, I would say Octavia Butler. Um, <laughs> if you don't know Octavia Butler, um, science fiction, speculative fiction, 
writer. Um, she actually, the way that she wrote science fiction has pretty much predicted the moment we're in. Um, so if you want to learn more about, and this is a black woman saw the future as Tanya said from the beginning and nobody listened. <laughs> um, I think other, other folks, I would say um, Dr. Sonia Sanchez, uh, who always has brilliant things to say and is um, really gives a, a, a really insightful perspective of how even some of the struggles that were faced in the 1960s and 1970s, how we might utilize that information in this moment to actually manifest some of the things we want to see. So those are a few of my folks, but um, again, really nurtured and nourished by this conversation with you all. I, I was tired because I was teaching right before this and I was a little bit tired, but y'all have rejuvenated me. I feel like I can do, I, I can do some stuff now. Yes. <laughs> You got the word, Garlia. Oh, she's pulling a book up. I pull. Well, no, I, I just, I think about because I, I'd been separated from my, book, book, books for such a, a, a long time. So when I was able to move, move, like this isn't, this is an old book that I had, um, and, and so just like you know, I, I write in my books and I put and I, there's just a lot of no, no, no notes, and I think. I, I started to read through through this recently and just I think so much of the of the conversation that we've been having you just find in these essays and just I think the older I get settling into how m many sides and angles and parts of a, of a black woman the, the, that there are, you know, and and I'm so thrilled that I was put in this body and the and 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 this space because I feel like it it is it is it is hard work to get through as a as a black woman. We've all been talking about that. We create our own spaces and do our own things, and but there's so much joy and there's so much beauty too. And, you know, I mean, that's where we start. We are be beautiful and we are jo uh, joy joyful and we've had to, we, we have endured through so much. And then, and, and we still smile and we still laugh and we still make space for other pe people and we still g give to others before we give back to ourselves, which, you know, that's, that's a dance that I think we all do even as as a moms, we're all like, okay, which which one first? <laughs> um, but yeah. Well, I want to thank you, Garlia Cornelia Jones. Thank you, Dr. Monica White Indunu. Thank you, Dr. Nicole Hodges Persley. Thank you, Rodney, who doesn't have a last name here for me. I have to thank to all of the people, Erica and Anne, who have um, facilitated the technical aspect of this today. Thank you again to TCG, Teresa Eyring, Devin Berkshire, Erica Lauren Ortiz, and Sierra Leone. Also to HowlRound, the Jay Matthew, Taya Rogers, and to my Red Pill team, Katie Rosen, Paul Sue, Doris Cassap, Sam Morris, um, and the event producer for today, Crystal Chase. So I'm going to close with a quote from the brilliant Stacey Abrams. Um, if you haven't read her new book, like after her, not her with her eight romance novels and her two uh, nonfiction books, I just went through in a day her new book, While Justice Sleeps. And that was a prediction of the, the moment that we're getting ready to head into now. So I'm going to close with a quote from, from Miss Stacey Abrams. We will all at some point encounter hurdles to gaining access and entry, moving up and conquering self-doubt. But on the other side is the capacity to own opportunity and tell our own story. All of us women here today are doing it. And in the next uh, six months, every month, I'm gonna bring in three other amazing black women to uh, center them in the work that they're doing. So I thank you to everyone who came here today. May you all be blessed and have a beautiful evening. Stay safe. Thank you.